Thank you for attending today's researcher talk. I'm Richard Hunt, the director of the Center for Legislative Archives, which is the sponsor of this series. Looking ahead, in July, our researcher talk on Thursday the 11th will feature Scott Podolsky, professor of the history of medicine at Harvard Medical School, who will discuss his new book, The Antibiotic Era, Reform, Resistance, and the Pursuit of a Rational Therapeutics published by Johns Hopkins University Press earlier this year. We have no talk scheduled for August, but we'll resume in September with Robert Much's Buy, Buying the Vote, Oxford University Press, which is a history of 20th century campaign finance. Today's researcher talk has been much anticipated, and we are delighted to host Peter Schulman, Assistant Professor of History at Case Western Reserve University. Peter earned his undergraduate degree and his PhD degrees, degree from the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was the Andrew Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in the Humanities at Johns Hopkins University before he joined the History Department faculty at Case Western Reserve University. Peter is quite familiar to all of us at the center because he was the recipient of the first National Archives Legislative Archives Fellowship that was established by archivist David Ferriero. The arch archivist would have loved to be here today to congratulate Peter, but he's in London to take part in the observance of the anniversary of the signing of the 1215 Magna Carta. That's, that's the only thing that could trump Peter's talk. <laughs> During his fellowship, Peter conducted significant research in House and Senate records, mainly in 19th century petitions sent to Congress. In October 2011, his work in progress was the subject of a colloquium hosted by the archivist with participating historians from the House and Senate history offices, several government agencies, and local universities. He returned to the archives in 2013 for a presentation at the Association of Centers for the Study of Congress's annual conference where he discussed the importance of House and Senate records for his work. Today we will hear about his new book, Coal and Empire, The Birth of Energy Security Industrial in Industrial America which Johns Hopkins University Press earlier this year announced would be available on June 6th. Hopkins Press missed their deadline. Consequent, <laughs> consequently, we have no books on hand. Coal and Empire will be out next month, but we have something better, which is Peter himself, to give us the preview of his book. We'll have time for question and answers following the presentation. Please raise your hand and we'll share a microphone so we can record you on our video. Welcome back, Peter. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> so thank you to Richard. I don't have to change my, my thank yous because I was going to thank Richard McCulley. So thank you, Richard Hunt. Uh, and uh, thank you to, to Richard McCulley who helped uh, organize uh, my presentation today. It's always wonderful to be back uh, at the National Archives. This has been a, uh, a home for me as a historian as I learned to become a historian uh, for the past uh, 15 years or so. And I've had enormous support uh, along the way from, from your office, from the the archivists here and the archivists of the United States who um, I wasn't expecting to see, but I, I was delighted that he knew about the talk, and uh, I hope he has a wonderful uh, visit in, in England. Um, uh, so when I, uh, my mother is here today in the audience, and when she came to my dissertation defense, which was back in 2007, uh, I had described that my understanding at that point of the process of scholarship was, it's kind of like a life cycle. Like the beginning of a project, it's like having a baby. Like there's all this excitement, you have all these ideas, you don't know where it's gonna go, it's really exciting. And then when I imagined at the time when the project is finished, when you have that book, it's like, you know, there's, there's, it's adulthood. You've, you've accomplished something, it's there, it's physical, it's tangible. And the dissertation was kind of like the awkward teenage years of, of scholarship. So I went through those awkward teenage years. Now we're, we're almost there. This is, this is the closest I can show you of the book. Uh, this is what I made my index off of and did the, the final page proofs. It's here. You're welcome to take a look at it. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it, it's out July 23rd. You can pre-order it from Amazon if you're interested. It's, it's available. I'm happy to email you any, uh, like an autograph or something. And he was interested. Um, so I wanted to start with a little bit of background on, uh, on this project, where it came from, how I came to it, uh, and then kind of give you an overview of what the, what the big picture is, what my main arguments are, and then why I think uh, this is a significant subject uh, to study. So um, I spent the summer living in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the summer of 2000. 
uh, I was uh, finishing college, and I had an internship at the Rand Corporation, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. And uh, I was interested at the time in environmental issues, environmental politics, policy. And I was tasked on a project uh, that looked at uh, the future of energy. What would the future of energy production and consumption look like in the United States? And the funding was from the uh, Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office. And they wanted to know, of all the people who've made predictions about what the future is going to look like, how much coal, how much oil, how much gas, nuclear, renewables, whatever, um, what is it going to look like? Can you, can you somehow synthesize all of these different predictions from governments, from academics, from corporations, and kind of give us an idea, if we want the future to look like this, what are the policy steps right now we have to take to get there? So I spent the summer working on that. It was very fun. It was very interesting. And it was really my first exposure to thinking about energy in a more or less social context. It wasn't energy in terms of how physicists or engineers may think about it, but in terms of broader society. And this really hit home for me one day when uh, I was on my way to work, and I was in one of the metro stops here in DC, and there was a very big uh, poster, an advertisement, advertising the metro. The metro was advertising the metro, and it was saying, you should ride the metro because, uh, unlike driving your car, the metro doesn't pollute. Now, there are lots of very good reasons to ride public transportation, uh, and all things considered, it, it may be ecologically uh, better to, to take the metro than, than driving, certainly less hassle. Uh, but having spent the summer working on kind of the hidden infrastructure of energy, it was kind of a ludicrous statement, right? At the time, this is 2000, uh, coal made up a little over 50% of the, the source of electricity generated in the United States. And coal pollutes, right? It pollutes whether it's in terms of uh, sulfur or other, other chemicals or we talk about global warming, right? There are, there are consequences uh, to, uh, to burning coal, many, many consequences. Uh, and that was really my first kind of click of there's a whole world here that I want to understand better that is not entirely obvious. And it, at this moment, in 2000, people studying energy from a social perspective, whether we're historians or anthropologists, sociologists, were kind of at a, a nadir. The, the topic, the subject kind of rises and falls with energy's uh, presence in the news. And at the time, it was kind of low. I decided when I went to graduate school, this was the kind of subject I wanted uh, to study. So I go to graduate school, uh, I stay at MIT, and uh, I thought what I would work on is something that connected uh, the geopolitics of oil to the broader kind of technical issues around oil production, scientific, engineering, environmental. That was the kind of the stuff my program did, it was the stuff I was interested in, it was I, I thought where I could bring a contribution. Uh, and at the time, uh, scholars who studied geopolitics really typically had very little to say about science and engineering and environment. And those who studied the science and engineering and environment of energy typically didn't have very much to say about the geopolitics. And I thought this could be a contribution to try to bring these uh, two sil separate silos uh, together. So I did what I think lots of historians do, which is like I wanted to go back to well, where does this come from, right? Where is the earliest point when people are talking about energy, talking about oil, as a subject of both geopolitics and uh, its kind of technical issues. And so I went back to the early 20th century. And there was a lot of material there. And this is where historians who've written about uh, American foreign oil policy, they go back to maybe the end of the 19th century, typically the very beginning of the 20th century. Really, there's a big takeoff around World War I. But I found all of the people I was looking at in their memos, in their reports, in their letters, in their uh, and other documents that you dig up, old newspaper articles, the same people who were, in fact, talking about uh, oil were talking also about coal and saying things, if you went back far enough, saying things to the effect of, and yes, oil is very interesting and important, just like we've already been discussing with coal for years, decades, uh, whatever the question may be. So I figured I would start to dig a little further back and maybe look at the coal story as the preface, right? Just the beginning of a chapter for the dissertation. Maybe it'll be the first chapter. And as happens to many historians, I got dragged further and further into the past until Cole took over the whole subject. And I, I found that's what uh, I was writing about um, altogether. So, um, and part of that experience was coming here, was coming to the archives uh, here and, and seeing what uh, naval officials, uh, people on the general board of the US Navy, which got founded at the turn of the 20th century, what they were writing about when they looked at naval strategy. They, write, they wrote a lot about Cole. 
So um, what I want to do now is kind of give you a, a kind of a broad overview of, of the book uh, and kind of show you where, uh, where I wound up instead of where I started, where I wound up. And the basic question that I ask, this is kind of the framing question, and the book kind of covers the more or less century between 18, about 1840 and 1940. And the question that I, I want to understand is, how did Americans come to think about energy in terms of national security in the first place? That's the basic question, right? It, it, it says it's an intellectual question. I, I'm not so much focused on how much fuel was produced where. This stuff comes up in the book. But my real question was an intellectual one. When did Americans start thinking about energy in terms of national security? And why? How? How did that process work? Because as it turns out, it wasn't obvious. Uh, today, uh, as, as, as I write about, I mean, there's any number of books that take for granted that energy is a major issue in national security and foreign relations. Um, and I don't think anybody here has to be convinced of that. But it wasn't obvious in the 19th century. It took time to, for Americans and others around the world to think of energy in precisely those, uh, those terms. And that's really what the book is, uh, is about. So I open it uh, with a little vignette uh, about this episode. This is actually Valentine's Day of 1945. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt meeting with uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. Uh, and uh, it's a very historic meeting. There's been a lot uh, written about it. I'm happy to talk uh, about it uh, later if you're, if you're interested. And it's a meeting that has a lot of significance in the history, not only of American Mideast relations, American-Saudi relations, but how uh, scholars subsequently have thought about America's role in the world with respect to energy. Obviously, over the decades that followed, Americans and Saudis became very, very intimately related as producers and consumers of oil. As far as I can tell, and as far as any scholar has been able to tell, there's no evidence that in this meeting they ever mentioned oil, that it ever came up, which is kind of surprising. Um, the, the only evidence that, 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 they, uh, that they did was in a, uh, a retrospective memoir from a couple of years later from one of the uh, figures who was there. But if you go back and look at his diary at the time, he doesn't mention it. So it's, it's probably, they probably didn't mention it. But it was very much in the background. It was very much motivating why officials in the State Department and the Navy Department and the War Department were interested in Saudi Arabia in the first place at this end period of, of World War II. And they were thinking prospectively about the future. What would, it, what would the future look like in terms of energy supplies, not just for the United States, which still then produced a lot of oil, uh, but for American companies who had a major concession to, to drill in Saudi Arabia, there was a lot of ideas that there might be a lot of oil, but it wasn't entirely, they weren't producing very much at the time, or I probably weren't producing anything at the time. Um, and so this is kind of a forward-looking uh, meeting. But it's often taken by scholars as a kind of turning point in how Americans thought about energy going abroad, instead of being self-sufficient as Americans had traditionally been in terms of oil production. Americans, up until the middle of the 20th century, had been the dominant producers of oil uh, in the world. So this is an important meeting. But then I go back a full century to 1845. Uh, and this is a, a, a colored um, uh, etching of the discovery of coal on the island of Labuan, which is off the coast of Borneo, right near where Brunei is today. And uh, in 1845, the USS Constitution, which is a ship that is still around, the oldest still commissioned ship in any, any Navy in the world, in fact, up in Boston, uh, the Constitution, Old Ironsides, uh, was sent on a secret mission. Well, the mission wasn't secret, but this part of it actually was secret. This was, not, this was in the, the, the what would be effectively the classified directions uh, from the Secretary of the Navy to sail around the world. It was a around the world cruise, and they were supposed to you know, carry the flag and say, hey, wherever you are, Zanzibar, you should open commerce with the United States. Uh, but the secret part was go to Borneo, negotiate with the Sultan of Brunei for access to coal. Now, the Constitution then, as now, is a, a sailing vessel, but Americans already in the 1840s were thinking about the infrastructure of energy, what we would today call the infrastructure of energy. Where would the fuel come from to make possible the things they wanted to do. And the things they wanted to do in 1845 involved setting up steamship lines, uh, commercial steamship lines, perhaps they'd be subsidized by the federal government in various ways, um, to carry the mail, to, which was the, what made it constitutional, uh, to carry uh, commerce, to carry people uh, all over the world, across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, to trade with China. 
And so the Constitution arrives in, in Borneo in 1845, and they try to get this concession, uh, access to, to uh, coal in, in Borneo or, or Labuan. Uh, and for various reasons that I read about in the book, it did not work out. They weren't able to get this concession. The British had beaten them to it uh, by what turns out to be a couple of weeks uh, through a series of misunderstandings. Um, but it was an indication that this question of going abroad looking for energy, looking for a source of energy, uh, is actually kind of an, old, an older story, an older story than we, we usually think about. And the book is basically tracing the, the path between these two meetings, between this, this expedition in 1845 and Franklin Roosevelt's meeting uh, in, uh, in 1945. What, what's, the, what's the space here? There are a lot of similarities, American representatives going abroad looking for fossil fuels. There are a whole lot of important differences, and the differences are what I, I focus on um, in the book. So um, here's the argument. I actually have three arguments, and I'll, I'll talk about them each in, in succession. Uh, three arguments in the book. And this is the first one. And I think this won't be surprising given what I've said so far. It's that Americans first started to think about energy in terms of national security back in the 19th century around coal, not in the 20th century around oil. And as it turns out, as I write about in the book, a lot of what Americans come to do with, uh, with oil later and how they think about oil was a very seamless transition from how they'd been thinking about coal. Now, the production of oil is very different from the production of coal. The companies that were involved were very different. The capitalization is very different. The labor is very different. The locations are often very different of where it's produced, the geographies of production. Uh, but how the consumers thought about it, the consumers in this case being Americans in the Navy or in the, in the Army or in uh, 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 thinking more broadly about the security of the economy, those consumers uh, thought about them in very similar ways. So, um, so how? Why, why did, why did the, how did this process happen? How does it begin? Well, it actually begins not with the Navy, but with the post office. Uh, the post office is really one of the most fascinating institutions in American history. And I, I would encourage anybody, if who's interested, I have a giant reading list on the post office if you want to learn more about it. We don't typically think of it as a very interesting institution uh, today. Uh, since the 70s, it's basically been a kind of quasi quasi-independent agency that uh, you know, operates more or less as a business with the constraints that they can't make business decisions without Congress approving them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a complicated institution. Um, but back in the 19th century, the post office was basically the IT branch of the nation, if not just the federal government, really the nation itself. And this was certainly how many Americans thought about it uh, in the late 18th into the middle of the 19th century. The post office was the, uh, the institution that made representative democracy possible. Okay? Uh, and, and they did this. If you, if you think about how you know, when the founders wrote the Constitution, they really made, made a provision, a clear provision in the Constitution itself. Yes, we, we're going to have a post office, and, and this will be uh, run by the federal government. Uh, and why? Well, at some level, there's a continuity uh, between how the Americans as colonists had interacted with a British post office. But there was a new element uh, as well, which was no one, no state in the history of the world had ever attempted representative democracy uh, on the, the geographic scale of the United States. It was a vast, already, I mean, in the late 18th century, already a vast amount of area. And it would only expand, of course, over the, over the coming decades. Uh, and Americans worried, well, how, how will we know what's going on in Washington? Right? How, if they're making decisions that are going to affect us, how do we know? Uh, and how do our representatives know what we feel and what we think? Right? Uh, this is why Americans found various ways to subsidize newspapers in the 19th century. Which, again, I'm happy to talk about how they, how they did this. It's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, they, we, we, subsidized, uh, we subsidized the news back in the 19th century. Uh, we found various ways, Americans found various ways to uh, create post office, a vast network across the country to really facilitate uh, representative democracy. It was a, a really key element of, of republic, what well, was then called republicanism. So this was a kind of a continental issue, but Americans also thought about information traveling abroad. And if you go to the uh, kind of the two decades or so after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, so kind of the mid late 18 teens uh, into the 1830s, uh, Americans became the, the dominant uh, um, country operating transatlantic mail communication. Right? This is a ship uh, from the Black Ball Line, named for obvious reasons. There's a big 
black disc atop one of its foresails. Uh, and this was one of the ships that was part of a, a whole line of ships. There were many, uh, many of these uh, lines that, that were around. Uh, they were very fast ships, and they would regularly transport mail across the Atlantic back and forth to Britain, to France, to, to other countries that eventually get to the rest of Europe. And this was very important. It was very important not just because of personal correspondence, although immigration to the United States was very uh, high and, and growing at increasing rates at the time. So this was, this was important for uh, new arrivals to connect back with their, their homes, their, their former homes, uh, but also for business correspondence, uh, diplomatic instructions, uh, newspapers themselves. Uh, Americans thought about newspapers as this is, this is how we understand, how, how we present the American perspective on what's going on in our country or in the world. And they faced constant obstacles to getting their newspapers and diplomatic instructions and business correspondence across the ocean. Um, so it was very important. And what gradually came to happen in the 1830s as engineers developed steamships that could, in fact, travel all the way across the Atlantic Ocean without stopping, um, the British government started subsidizing them. Uh, the Cunard Line is the most famous, but there were lines all around uh, different major routes that connected the British Empire together. Um, and Americans began losing out on this flow of information. They began to become uh, very aware that when they sent their letters, uh, they were getting kind of left behind on the ships while the British delivered the letters of their business people, uh, and then they went back and got the American ones. Uh, or the diplomatic instructions would kind of just sit and not make it to uh, the um, the minister's office in London or, or anywhere else. Or the newspapers would be uh, taxed at prohibitive rates. So uh, Americans couldn't afford to send them to Central Europe. So those in Germany would not know what's going on in the country. Uh, and this was a, a very a very worrisome uh, turn of, uh, of events. So Americans in the 1840s started subsidizing uh, steamships of their own, mail steamers, to carry the mail. This is one, a ship, um, the Charleston, that traveled between... Um, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's the Isabel. The ship is called the Isabel. It traveled between uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and Havana, uh, Cuba. Uh, it's actually a beautiful ship. Uh, and it's another one, the Baltic. This was a, a, one of the uh, Collins Line steamers that traveled across the Atlantic. This was actually probably the most luxurious uh, steamship of the early 1850s uh, in the world. Uh, there, there were four of these, these ships um, uh, in, the, in the Collins Line, uh, two of which met very um, unfortunate uh, ends. The line went down. But it does show how uh, importantly Americans were thinking about information. They wanted to compete. They wanted to make sure that they could get their information around the world. Now, why in a story about uh, coal and energy am I spending so much time talking about the mail? Well, with these steamships uh, came the problem of coal. And this is what Americans began to experience again and again in the Caribbean, going across the Atlantic, going down to South America, going up the West Coast when they would travel down through Panama, up the West Coast to, to, to California uh, and, and Oregon and beyond. It was very difficult to deal with the coal. It turns out different kinds of coal burn differently in different circumstances. They were good for different kinds of uses. Uh, if they were traveling to a port that didn't have a, a major mine nearby, there might not be any coal at all. It might be very expensive, shipped in from somewhere else. Um, maybe even from uh, another continent. Uh, so this was, this was a serious problem uh, that really became uh, very acute in the 1840s and 1850s. So this is what I, what I turn to next in the book, is looking at, well, what did Americans do? How do they respond to this problem of coal? And this is where I got to bring in my interest in science and uh, history of technology to understand that the approach was not simply a political one, but one that turned to scientists and engineers, what we would now call, anyway, scientists and engineers uh, to solve these problems. So I'll, I'll talk about uh, um, um, one of those uh, now. Uh, so this is a, uh, a device. Um, I, I, I won't explain every single. I spent actually a whole day staring at it, trying to figure out exactly what each piece of it did, um, ultimately to no avail. I, I think the actually explanation in, the, in the, uh, the report was simply flawed in a way that I could not make out what was actually going on. But the basic idea was this was a device that was uh, put together by a chemist um, in Philadelphia named Walter R. Johnson. And Johnson was one of the founding members of the, the Franklin, or an important figure in the Franklin Institute. He was a professor. And uh, in about 1842, he turned to the federal government and he said, Coal is really important. It's important to our Navy. It's important to our, our growing number of steamships that are going to be carrying the mail. Uh, this is a really important 
uh, thing to understand. And we can't become uh, complacent or dependent on some other, other country. We need to understand what we have. And so he, uh, through the government, through the Navy sponsored this uh, series of experiments, uh, he solicited um, donations of coal from, different, from, from Pennsylvania, from Maryland, from Virginia, from uh, Nova Scotia. They got foreign dealers to ship them coal from, from Britain and from other places. And he performed a series of exper uh, experiments in the early 1840s to understand how did different coals burn differently. Uh, which coals were better suited for which purposes? Uh, how much energy would you get from a given volume or weight or, or what? what? What's the appropriate measurement uh, of, uh, of coal? And he tested woods as well, because sometimes woods were, especially in railroads, were often uh, burned in, instead. Uh, and he found that different coals burned differently. Uh, in, uh, actually, through a series of experiments, um, this first set of experiments, he actually found that the best coals were actually from Western Maryland, from, from Cumberland. It's a kind of bituminous coal. Uh, and the, the, the miners in Maryland, they loved this. They were very excited that they beat the uh, an, uh, bit, uh, anthracite coal uh, from uh, eastern Pennsylvania. And the anthracite country was very upset about this. Uh, and they pushed for many years to get new, new, get new, new experiments. Our coal is, ju is, is just as good. And there was a big, intense rivalry uh, between these, uh, these two producers for some time. And the reason why they, they, they were uh, having this rivalry for attention from the federal government from, the, from this research was not simply that they wanted to be the coal that the Navy would purchase for its ships, as nice as that would be to have a nice, secure government contract, um, but because Navy ships traveled all over the world. And if they traveled to London or India or China or wherever, and they were basically advertising this particular kind of, of high quality American coal, this might open up a vast export market. And at the time, you could, this was not an idle um, uh, idea. Uh, if you look at British uh, coal exports, they just go through the roof in the 1840s and 50s, up thousands of percent uh, in their exports all over the world. And uh, producers in Pennsylvania and Maryland looked at this and said, this could be us. Uh, it, it didn't end up being them, but it could have been. And, th and this is something they, they thought very seriously uh, about. Um, other times, uh, uh, engineers uh, and other kinds of scientists looked at this question. Um, this is a set of drawings uh, by a Thomas Eubank, uh, who was the commissioner of patents, the, the head of the patent office in, in Washington. And he describes in one of his memoirs uh, being in, uh, in New York, in Manhattan. He was looking to take a uh, carriage up to Harlem, which was then still separated by like, farmland in the middle of Manhattan. And he was looking at a, a fishmonger. He was looking at the marketplace. And he was looking at all the different shapes of tails of the, the porgies and the mackerels and the uh, all the different fish that were on display. And he thought, you know, we, maybe as we build our steamships, we should be looking to nature. Nature, which has created all these perfect forms, this would be the ideal way to understand how we should design our paddle wheels. So he starts studying the fish, the mechanics of, of fish. And he looks then at, at beavers and at um, uh, frogs' legs and uh, all sorts of other um, uh, uh, animals and uh, other shapes. And uh, he produced these very large memoirs at the very beginning of the 1850s. Uh, and he's very explicit. This is a way to economize fuel. And this is the concept I write about in the book, economy. Now, today we talk about efficiency and economy more or less interchangeably. But in the middle of the 19th century, the terms meant very different things. Uh, efficiency comes to mean, as we think about it today, you know, it's a property of a machine, of a steam en engine. right? We're products of of thermodynamics, right? Uh, understanding what is the maximum output possible uh, by laws of physics of a given, you know, given how much energy you put in, what's the maximum energy you're going to get out? That is our modern way of thinking in terms of efficiency. And by the early 20th century, we talk about you know the efficiency of individual workers. It's a very much what is possible, the maximum possible uh, property of an object. Um, but economy was very different. Economy was a value, right? Economy was uh, it was not a thing, right? There was no measurement of the economy uh, of the 19th century, right? There was no, you know, we, today we have barometers of, you know, what's GDP and well, unemployment rates, right? That doesn't happen until the 20th century. It's actually a very interesting history, but we didn't, nobody did that in the 19th century. They didn't have that concept of the economy, right? There was economy, right? Uh, um, home economics comes out of this thinking about economy, right? It, economy is the proper management of the household. Right? You don't want to be par parsimonious. You don't want to be you know, uh, uh, hoarding your resources too much. 
but you don't want to spend everything. Uh, what's the proper management of the household? Political economy just expands that uh, management to the state, right? How do you properly manage the state and everything in it? That's political economy, one, one interpretation of political economy. So Americans of the mid-19th century, engineers included, scientists included, were thinking about how to economize the use of fuel in these steamships, naval steamships, mail steamships, commercial steamships. How do we find ways to build the ships differently, to uh, find the different kinds of, of fuel, to invent new sources of, of power that are not steam, right? Engineers at the time start looking at uh, electrodynamical engines and engines powered by air and all sorts of other strange uh, contraptions. They were living at a time where the steam engine was still a relatively new innovation for travel. I go, it goes back to the 17th century, but in terms of being on railroads or being on, um, uh, on steamships, it was a pretty new thing. So they, well, maybe something new is going to come along, and uh, lots of Americans were very much uh, interested in that. And so you see these, these uh, other inventions to better economize fuel. Uh, this is a, uh, an anti-friction roller for attaching um, uh, uh, propellers to replace paddle wheels. Right? And the inventor of this, George Parry, was very interested. He said very explicitly, right, this is a better way to get more power uh, with the same amount of fuel or, or, or even perhaps uh, less. Um, this is a condenser. Uh, used to purify, take the salt out of ocean water to use in boilers, again, to keep the machines running as economically uh, as possible. Um, and to me, the interesting thing about thinking about economy is if it's not just a property of a machine, like efficiency would come to be, uh, then it, it wasn't just about the design of the machine that mattered or what you put into it, but a much bigger network of where fuels came from, how operators were trained to, to use it, um, how to be kind of res a responsible owner of your, uh, of your steam engine. So, you know, I mentioned uh, Borneo, this expedition to Borneo in 1845. Uh, this was actually another way to economize fuel, to kind of build this network uh, to support uh, prospective American commerce and trade uh, abroad. And you can see kind of relatedly, this was a, an expedition to Japan uh, under Matthew Perry, Commodore Perry, who you, you might have uh, you might be familiar with uh, in the 1850s, was really very much kind of a follow-on idea. Uh, Perry was very focused on coal. And if anything, you might say that the most important object of his mission was coal. Uh, despite some of the public uh, pronouncements, uh, he was very, very careful to say, well, um, we're going out there because there are sailors getting shipwrecked on Japan and we need to you know, protect the, the American citizens, which was all true. Uh, but he was very explicit in his private correspondence that the real reason was, we want to get to China. There's this vast market in China, and we need to develop steamship lines to get there. And if you look at the best route to go to China from the Pacific, right, it goes, grazes right past uh, Japan. I'll talk a little bit about it. It may not look that way on a map. On a on a map. You look at a globe, it is actually the best, the best way to go. Uh, he was very aware of that. Uh, so um, he didn't want to focus too much on that, but Japan at the time, no one was thinking about, no Americans were thinking about it as a, you know, a, a country that could quickly open up to foreigners or uh, industrialize as rapidly, of course, as it ended up doing in the 19th century and becoming such an important uh, geopolitical power in such a short period of time. They were thinking, it's in the way to get to China. It's a great place to stop. If we had to stop somewhere to refuel, we've heard there's lots of coal there. Wouldn't that be convenient? So this is an expedition um, I believe this one was on Formosa, uh, uh, island of it's now Taiwan. Uh, Perry sent uh, other officers to go to the Luchu Islands to scout out coal there. Um, he's very focused on where he's going to supply his own ships with coal. He looks for prospective places to establish coaling stations on various islands, um, all to support this, this, this future American trade uh, at a time when the British hadn't quite conquered the Pacific Ocean yet and Americans were ready to concede the rest of the shipping lanes of the world to them. They thought the, the Pacific ought to be an American uh, domain. So very, coal is very much behind um, uh, this expedition. That's kind of the, the first argument. We really need to think earlier uh, in this history. Now the second one has to do with uh, you know, my own background as a historian of technology in thinking about industrialization as a process alongside uh, American foreign relations and for history of foreign policy and, and uh, at times you might call it the history of the American empire. But these are two very interrelated histories. You can't just tell them, um, them separately. 
Um, now, uh, to give kind of an e example of this, uh, there's a chapter in the book where I look at the American Civil War. And uh, coal becomes very important in the Civil War. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of ships are built uh, for the war. A lot of the mail steamers that were still around that had been built in the 1840s and 50s get basically drafted into service. Um, so coal becomes very important. And w this chapter focuses, uh, among other things, on uh, this question of colonization. Now, this is for, for, I don't know if there are any Civil War buffs in the audience. This is a topic that Civil War buffs are very interested in. Historians are very interested in for, for very good reason. Uh, if you go back to the early part of the 19th century, uh, there are many Americans who are perfectly aware that the problem, the big central problem of the United States was the existence and persistence of slavery. They knew it was a problem. They didn't know how to get rid of it. Uh, and so many Americans got together and said, well, uh, we would like to get rid of slavery. We don't know how. We need to do it in a constitutional way. Um, why don't we just separate the races, right? We, we don't, if we don't want to have slavery anymore, uh, we also don't believe that uh, white people and black people can live in the, same, uh, in the same country in any peaceful way. So if we're going to get rid of slavery, we also have to get rid of the, the former slaves themselves. So Americans create, Francis Scott Key is one of the founders of this, and, and I'm from Baltimore, so I'll mention that. Um, they create the American Colonization Society. And the, the society and other kind of local branches in different states attracts lots of elite interest over the decades that follow, over the, the early and middle part of the 19th century. People like Henry Clay are presidents of the society. Lincoln is a big uh, admirer. Some of his cabinet members were, were themselves deeply involved. And Lincoln himself is, is really a perfect example of someone who abhorred slavery and is, was, has said this his entire life, um, but couldn't see uh, and, and it's debated whether he ever, in fact, changed his mind or not, couldn't see a, uh, blacks and whites living in the same place uh, peacefully. He couldn't see it. He, didn't, uh, he wasn't able to conceptualize this happening. He was very interested in sending them uh, somewhere else. Now, one of the um, results of this is the, the colony of Liberia, which is founded um, about 1820, 1821 or so. And uh, not many people go. Um, this is really the, the reality that most uh, free blacks, freed slaves or otherwise, did, the only country they knew was the United States, and that was where they, they wanted to stay. Some, go, some went, but not very many. Um, but come the Civil War, uh, Lincoln becomes very interested in the possibility of sending freed slaves somewhere else. Liberia was very far. Um, what about somewhere closer to home? And the place that becomes uh, his, his greatest focus is this region of um, kind of on the border of Costa Rica and Panama called Chiriqui. Uh, at the time, what's now Panama was part of what's now Colombia. Uh, it actually changed its name to Colombia right about this time. And uh, there, it was a very interesting frontier sort of place. Actually, a lot of parallels between kind of the American West at this time and, uh, and this region, uh, which had once been very prosperous as a kind of transshipment point for the Spanish Empire, taking in you know, silver from the Philippines, stopping off here, then on back onto to Europe. Um, but it had kind of fallen into a, something of a, of a backward uh, economic place. Uh, people from all over the world wound up there seeking their fortune. They usually didn't find it, including the guy that I write about, uh, Ambrose Thompson. Now, Ambrose Thompson's an interesting figure. He's, he was originally born in Delaware, moved to Philadelphia, uh, tried to get the U.S. government to sponsor him on these mail steamship lines. He, Richard mentioned that I... I spent a lot of time looking at uh, petitions and memorials to Congress. His was, uh, was several of them. He wrote several petitions and memorials uh, trying to get funding to establish steamship lines to Ireland, to China, to wherever. Uh, he didn't get any, unfortunately, for him. But his next big project was getting a series of concessions in this region uh, of, of Chiriqui where he thought he could build um, a, uh, a kind of port a city, a colony of, um, of expats from somewhere. And he was very excited because he believed he found lots of evidence of coal. And this is how the project was sold. This was going to be, in Ambrose Thompson's mind, the source for uh, industrial fuel throughout the Caribbean. Um, for any US naval ships who are sailing around the Caribbean, this could be the, the source of their fuel. And he tried selling this project to the James Buchanan administration at the end of the 1850s. And then he turned, uh, when Lincoln got elected, uh, to them as well. 
Now, part of my interest here, lots of historians have written about colonization. What does it show about American racial politics in the Civil War? Was it ever, in fact, possible? Uh, would it have happened? You know, why didn't it happen? Uh, how does it relate to the Emancipation Proclamation? All very interesting, important things. But the side of it that no historians really focused on in much detail is the fact that really it was a project to develop coal. And Lincoln understands this. Um, he had a very, very clear belief that this was something that was going to be very important for the war effort um, in fueling the Navy, which was experiencing tremendous difficulty in the Caribbean maintaining its blockade of the, uh, the vast American coastline against uh, Confederate blockade runners. And he thought this was a, 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 a really good uh, solution. Actually, it would solve two problems. One, it would provide the coal and also get rid of the free blacks whom he thought um, would not really fit in this future uh, United States. Well, the project doesn't work out. I, I, I do, um, I read about why. I don't want to give you any spoilers on that. Uh, did I mention it's available on Amazon? You can, you can pre-order it. Um, but it, it, what was interesting to me about looking at this story from the perspective of coal is it unveiled this kind of whole uh, aspect of it that was uh, invisible unless you were, uh, for people, for historians who focused on uh, the racial politics, as important and central as that was, without understanding the industrial uh, energy perspective, you don't really understand how the players at the time were really thinking about what was at, uh, what was at stake. Now the last uh, argument that I make um, has to do with um, coaling stations. Now, maybe some of you have encountered these before. If you've ever read any of the, the literature on the history of American foreign relations in the late 19th century, really the time between the end of the Civil War and the war with Spain in 1898, uh, coaling stations come up a lot. And the debate has been, over many decades, uh, you know, what was the cause of the American empire? What was the, the, the origins of the American empire of, uh, that came after the Spanish-American War? And if you remember, after the war, the United States gets the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, ultimately, uh, Hawaii, which was annexed separately, but kind of part of the same, uh, the same moment uh, in time. And historians have, for very good reasons, wanted to understand, well, where did this empire come from? Now, obviously, there are precedents, as historians have written about it, with continentally, right? The United States was an expanding continental empire over the late 18th and early, uh, through the 19th century. But what explains uh, the, the, uh, the going abroad, this island empire? And many historians have turned to the Navy and to coaling stations and said, well, aha, right? There are lots of examples of Americans talking about the need for coaling stations, right? As, as Americans in the 1880s and 1890s started build, increasingly building uh, large uh, ocean-going steel ships that uh, were powered by coal, um, this clearly became, uh, apparently became, uh, an excuse for requiring coaling stations to refuel them. This, therefore, led to, uh, to the empire. Here's a coaling station, a, a drawing of one at uh, uh, the uh, Panama, ultimately at the Panama Canal. So this is early, early 20th century. They're very big. This is one of the, probably the biggest one in the world at the time. Well, what, what I argue in the book is it, it was really the opposite. Uh, if you actually look at what Americans were talking about when they were talking about coaling stations in the 19th century, most of the time they were uh, um, kind of what I call entrepreneurial diplomacy, kind of efforts to, uh, to make money. Uh, in various schemes, uh, various Americans, companies invested in Santo Domingo or in, uh, in Samoa and would say, well, obviously the United States has to support us in annexing Santo Domingo or uh, establishing some kind of protectorate over, um, uh, over Samoa or Hawaii or, or wherever be to protect our investment. It's really, it's necessary for naval operations because we need to have our Navy ships uh, sailing, patrolling these waters. Well, if you look at where the Navy actually went at the time, they typically went nowhere near where these entrepreneurs were saying it was so important to go. And you look at naval officers and, and uh, um, secretaries of the Navy, and they say the same thing. Like, well, this is kind of crazy. Uh, um, at the time, in 1870, early 1870s, when the uh, Grant administration was pushing very hard to annex uh, Santo Domingo, um, uh, an expedition of American representatives kind of goes out to survey it's a lot of fanfare. A bunch of journalists go with them, and the journalists were basically out of out of touch with their um, with their newspapers for uh, two or three weeks because they were going to such remote places that no one went to, which kind of underlined the point. It wasn't really necessary. No, one, it wasn't like a major shipping lane that uh, that uh, ships were using. It was an excuse for um, uh, to, uh, to to make a buck, to kind of put it simply. Um, so. Uh, and if you look at, even by the end of the 19th century, some of the Americans who've been most identified with advocating uh, 
uh, expansion of some kind. People like Alfred Thayer Mahan, one of the great theorists uh, of uh, American naval strategy, global naval strategy, right? When he talks about annexing Hawaii as being an important place to, for the United States to, to own, uh, if you actually look at what he says, he, does, he doesn't say the United States needs a coaling station in Hawaii to support its naval operations uh, in distant shores. He says, well, we need it only because if we don't take it, uh, Britain will. And if Britain takes it, we're vulnerable. We just need to prevent someone else from having it. It wasn't any kind of logistics argument about, uh, about any, uh, any kind of need, which is kind of why it's important to understand these arguments in their, own, uh, in their own context. Well, all of this changes after 1898. Um, instead of coaling stations being a cause of empire, empire is a cause of the need for coaling stations. Because once the United States has the Philippines and, uh, and Guam and Samoa and all of these, um, all of these colonies, uh, then, and, and they're a actively involved uh, in 1899 for several more years in putting, brutally putting down uh, um, uh, an insurrection in the Philippines. And as they think about uh, vulnerabilities from other imperial powers, uh, they say, well, we need to have an infrastructure to support the Navy or the Marines or whomever to be able to defend uh, these islands, to defend these, these territories. And uh, very quickly, that argument gets pushed back further in time than it ever actually existed to become where the, the, the consequence becomes the cause, which is, I think, a, a very big mistake. But what happens after 1890, and to give you an indication here, this is um, Pago Pago uh, in Samoa. Uh, this is the American coaling station that was built there. Uh, this is the end of the 1880s. Uh, it's a couple of thatched huts and a, a pile of coal um, that was pretty much untouched for about 10 years because no one went there. Um, from, I, think, I think this was from Harper's, one of the magazines. Um, but anyway, after, um, after 1898, uh, it, the, uh, um, this, uh, how to get coal around the world becomes a much more important uh, subject for people thinking about American uh, security. So just a, a couple of things before I, I wrap up here. What were Americans doing in the late 19th century if they were not seeking coaling stations? Well, I write about uh, one approach, which is to look towards mathematics. Um, this is a, a very weird kind of map. Uh, one of a couple kinds of maps that actually shows you the shortest distance between two points on uh, the map. Uh, if you look at it normal, I didn't, I should have brought a copy. If you look at a kind of a typical map, Mercator projection, the most common map you'll see, and you draw a straight line on the map, it is actually not the shortest distance between two places, right? If you were to take a globe and stick a pin in two places and draw a rubber band between them, that will show you the shortest path. And if you were to, uh, you know, then unwind that as a Mercator projection, your line would look like a big curve. This map makes the map in a way that the line is, in fact, the shortest distance. And you can see, um, right, tra traveling from uh, San Francisco, uh, if you want to get to uh, Japan, right, you brush by the Aleutian Islands. It's a very northern route, actually. Uh, and the Kurile Islands, and then ultimately to, to Japan. This is why Japan was on the way to China. Um, so Americans think, well, what are ways that we can navigate better in these, these direct routes? Back when ships were constrained by wind and, uh, and currents, you know, navigators knew the shortest distance between two routes, but it didn't matter because they couldn't take those routes. Once you had a steamship, they could. But the problem was the mathematics of calculating how to go that way were very, very complicated. With the Mercator projection, you make one calculation and you, you set your course and you go. And it's the, remain, the course remains the same all the way, which is why it was so convenient for navigators, even if it was roundabout. Um, if you're traveling along a great circle route, the shortest distance between two points on the globe, you have to keep redoing the calculations. So over the course of the late 19th century, American mathematicians develop all sorts of techniques to simplify how to calculate these, these great circle courses. Um, so I write about that, which I think is pretty interesting. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, they also try to, to, uh, to build um, ships that won't need coaling stations. Right? I actually showed this uh, back before here. This is a yeah, this one. All right, this is the cruiser, uh, the Brooklyn, um, the only armored cruiser that was named after a, uh, um, a city and not a state for some reason that I don't know. Um, and it's actually advertising a, a kind of coal, Pocahontas coal from Western uh, Virginia that was at the time kind of the, the, uh, the prize smokeless steaming coal uh, of the United States. Um, but Americans built ships that wouldn't need to stop, that had such vast coal capacities triple expansion engines that they could travel around the world without ever having to stop uh, in a port. You don't have to get a coaling station if you have a ship like that. But this affects how Americans thought about strategy, right? If they're, if they, if they're not going to have lots of coaling stations the way the British Empire did, 
then they can't have massive fleets that are fly, you know, travel, sailing all over the world. They need to have ships that are just focused on protecting commerce, like going to places where American commercial vessels went, and big battleships that couldn't go as far, but stayed very, very close to American shores where they could constantly go back to port uh, and refuel. Again, this all changes after 1898 when American shores are now in the Philippines. So, uh, so what happens? Uh, the last thing that I, that I write about in the book has to do with what I call the invention of logistics. And to me, actually, this is the, among the most interesting uh, parts of this subject. Uh, to, today, we take this, this concept of logistics for granted. It's a part of whether you're talking about Walmart or, uh, or the Pentagon, right? How to move things from one place to another is it's important. Um, uh, companies like FedEx or, or UPS, right, are they're masters of logistics. Um, if you go back and look at naval officers in the late 19th century, they've never heard of the word logistics. Uh, so what I do in the book is I, I look at the creation of the Naval War College, the original building back in Newport, uh, outside of Newport, Rhode Island. And I look at how this War College in the late 19th into the early 20th century basically created the subject, this idea of logistics as a subject to be studied, analyzed, uh, they worked with uh, Navy planners in Washington at the, the headquarters. They worked with ship captains who were sailing all over the world to do all sorts of research, to develop tables, uh, to manage resources, and to understand uh, how logistics related to strategy and tactics, which were the interesting things that naval officers wanted to study. Uh, and if you go back and look at the late 19th century, Mahan or others, they say, you know, strategy, this is what you really want to study. This is the interesting part. This is the exciting part. How to do it, you know, we're going to tell you what the strategy is and we'll let the, uh, the people at the bottom of the ship figure out how to, how to make it happen. By World War I, it's reversed. And the logisticians are saying, we're going to tell you what's possible. You can build your strategy around that, which is a tremendous shift. And this is a shift that I trace in the book looking at lecture courses, lecture notes, assignments, um, uh, and reports. It's a, it's a really interesting uh, topic. And it helps kind of lead into uh, the US Navy opening a coal mine up in Alaska right after World War I, which I write about. Uh, it leads to efforts to open up the Naval Petroleum Reserves. Teapot Dome is the most famous one. Uh, and it, there's a huge, you're probably familiar with the huge scandal associated with Teapot Dome. Uh, I write about the other scandal of Teapot Dome, which is not the political scandal which existed, but why so many other officers who were not on the take from you know, oil magnates why did they think this was a good idea to open up the reserves? Uh, and so I write about, well, this had to do with thinking logistically about operations in the Pacific, which were increasingly getting hemmed in by international law and, and, other, uh, and financial constraints. And American naval planners were very worried about this. And they saw opening up these reserves as the only way to build this logistics network that they needed, they thought they needed in the, the Pacific. This is kind of overarching arc of, of the story. So just to wrap up, I, want, I said I wanted to give you an indication of why I think this is important for today. Well, I want to say first as a historian, there's no reason why history has to be relevant. Um, <laughs> it, 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 I heard a story uh, many years ago about a historian who studied uh, Russian trains. And uh, he was asked at a conference, well, why do you study Russian trains? And he gave some explanation about, well, it was important for industrialization. And, but, but, why, but there are lots of things that are important. But why Russian trains? And finally, say, I like Russian trains. It's inter I like Russian trains. Um, so, you know, if you're a historian of uh, you know early medieval cathedrals, right, you don't have to justify why that's relevant to the early 21st century. It's important because it's interesting. It was important to them, so we should understand why. Okay, but I think this topic does have some relevance uh, for today, uh, and that comes around the concept of energy independence, which is a, a term I'm sure you've heard uh, before. Um, it was uh, uh, used first by Richard Nixon back with the first energy crisis in 73-74. Uh, I have a, a quote here that he talks about at the end of 73, where he announces project independence, where he says, you know, this is, uh, you know, our goal. He draws on Apollo, uh, moon landings. He draws on the Manhattan Project to say, you know, we can do this in 10 years, become energy independent. Uh, and every president since, you can look at Carter and uh, I don't remember Ford did, but certainly Carter and Reagan and Bush and Clinton and Bush and Obama have all used this, this phrase, energy independence, aspirationally. And they've clearly meant different things by it. They've clearly had different ideas of, of what it would take to get there and how, how independent you really have to be. What does it really mean? Um, now, economists have said, and I think they're right, that energy independence ultimately 
is, is kind of, when you talk about oil, is really uh, kind of a weird concept because the oil market is uh, global, right? Prices are set globally. If the United States stops buying uh, oil from the Middle East, right, other countries are going to buy it. Instead, the prices don't change. It doesn't really matter. It's, uh, this, it's, a, it's kind, of a, a, uh, um, kind of a silly concept. Um, but what I want to argue here is that the, the other problem is that the premise of energy independence was there once was a time when the United States was energy independent, right? And if you look at when the United States was overwhelmingly the world's uh, you know, producer of oil in the early 20th century, say, that seems plausible. But what I, I hope the contribution of this book is, uh, is that even if you go back to the 19th century, you see even when the United States was producing almost all of its coal, uh, it was still tied up with the rest of the world. And it was tied up with the rest of the world when it came to energy because the United States was tied up with the rest of the world. And as long as the United States is involved in the rest of the world, energy politics, energy geopolitics are going to exist in some form or another. As long as Americans are trying to get somewhere and do something, uh, our energy politics are going to be uh, intertwined. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, and I'm happy to take um, any questions. Time for maybe one or two questions. I think the room is booked at one o'clock. I'm sure Peter will hang around to answer some questions outside of the room. So you have to use the microphone. Do we have any questions? Who was funding those early scientists and engineers studying the economy? Like so the, studying like the economy of ships or the oh, economy of um, that's a good question. Uh, so, so one of the, the I mentioned um, Walter Johnson. Well, he was someone who got a contract from the government to do this. And, and there were some, um, uh, you know, internal studies that the Navy Department would sponsor. They would either hire someone outside, or they would sponsor one of their own uh, from the uh, Engineering Corps to um, to perform these experiments. You also, if you look, actually, you go to the microfilm here at the archives. You can look at, you know, letters to the Secretary of the Navy and uh, from ships captains, captains' letters, or letters from uh, from other uh, commodore. Uh, there's one of uh, uh, captains' letters and I forget what they are. But they're letters from other, you know, senior officers. And uh, often, you know, they'll be at sea and say, "I had a great idea," and they'll just send in a, a great idea. Uh, it may or may not be great, uh, but many others were um, were shipbuilders. This was actually one of the um, uh, kind of roundabout justifications for uh, subsidizing the mail steamers was to support the American uh, naval construction industry in Philadelphia and New York and elsewhere. And uh, so there were constructors and engineers, naval architects, uh, who would work on these ships, you know, either for the Navy or for commercial vessels and come up with new designs, new ideas, and try to sell them, um, sell the patent if they could. Uh, or, or just you know, get a contract uh, to build the ships. Yeah. You need a microphone. When you were when you were talking about um, Britain would have gotten Hawaii before yeah. the United States, this was the age of colonization. Yeah. And in other words, Hawaii could have been a British colony. Yeah. So it was not really just healthy competition, but it was fierce. It was fierce, and it, it was, and I think it was a fear, right? There, that was a lot of, fear, a lot of it lot was, of was fear. Um, you know, who, what's interesting, though, is you can certainly find the people who had that fear. And I, Mahan did. I mean, he thought it was inevitable that a, a weak uh, government would fall to a, to a strong one, precisely at this moment when Britain and France and Germany were, in fact, seizing all sorts of islands uh, in the Pacific. Whether that was in fact inevitable for Hawaii, which had a population that already had a lot of Americans in it, and that was clearly in the American economic orbit, um, I don't think I mean, we we can't run controlled experiments in history. I, I I'm I wouldn't say that was in fact inevitable, uh, but it's easy to find the people who said that now and say, well, they they said it before, and uh, they were in fact uh, afraid of that. But what's interesting is if you look at, you know, in the 1860s or 70s or 80s into the 1890s. Um, talking about Hawaii, for example, most Americans weren't that interested in Hawaii. And if you, if you look at you know, when um, uh, American uh, expats there were first trying to get a really big free trade treaty with the United States for, for sugar, um, you know, Grant and his Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish, they weren't really like, 
they weren't that interested. It wasn't really a big, they weren't seeing it as a major strategically important thing. They had a lot of other things to deal with. Um, uh, what would have happened had the U.S. not annexed Hawaii? I mean, keep in mind, the, the, there had been a coup in Hawaii that had dethroned the king and America to take, it was actually a really pretty ugly situation. But um, what would have happened? It's a great question. That's, that's, that's good for fiction, to, to know. <laughs> the alternatives. Good movie. Yeah, or movie, yeah. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you all.